um, they, they prepared a talk for us, very short, brief talk, personalized talk about themselves or maybe the view on women in tech and the tech industry in Africa. And then we'll have a panel, but we'll have question and answer time where you um, can all ask the mini question that you want to ask us. It's very interactive. Thank you. for joining us today and I am in Nairobi for the launch of Women in Tech Africa, uh, the Kenya chapter. We're so excited to be here with women and to learn more about Women in Tech Africa and to hear from our wonderful inspiring <laughs> My name is Emma Kupi and I'm uh, the CEO of NL Technology Consulting and also a founder of Women in Tech Africa. I'm so glad I was able to make it today so excited at uh, just the, the numbers of people that have come and the numbers of people that are excited about our um, event. <laughs> tell you a little bit about women in South Africa and what our mission is and what we've been doing for the last couple of years. And I invite you to be part of this amazing group and to support this amazing group in any way that you can. So, Women in Tech Africa started a while back. Um, I started it based on my experience as being a woman in the technology sector, having spent 12 years in the sector. Um, just bringing women together to network professionally, because I've come to understand, and, and the, the older I get in addition, the 70% of jobs are not advertised. And we wanted to provide a safe platform for women to come and share with each other opportunities and learn from each other. Um, we also wanted to be able to affect the, our communities around us. Uh, we wanted to be able to help support other women entrepreneurs in, in growing the technology process. We also wanted to help grow the pipeline of women that were interested in STEM careers. And we also wanted to showcase in the world that a strong African woman is capable of women in tech as now a membership of women across 30 African countries. Uh, that's, that's an amazing, it's an amazing statistic. Uh, we have we just launched the diaspora uh, group in, in London, in the UK. Uh, and obviously today we're launching uh, in Kenya. We've also done, we also had numerous networking and professional training events um, in Nigeria, in Lagos, um, as far as sort of social media with Lagos. We've also worked in training female entrepreneurs, uh, especially in Ghana, using technology to grow their businesses. We've had numerous networking programs that have brought women and help them match their businesses. So, in short, we really have three visions. And the one, one, one mission is to help 
for the women in the technology sector, supports them to bring glass ceilings and go to the next level, to affect our communities around us, is to take the skill sets and our, our, our strength and our networks to, to affect people around us, specifically entrepreneurs and young girls. And to also, again, show the world that the strong African woman is not something to be done. In ending, uh, I would like you to go in and join the rest of the event. In ending, I would like to thank IHAL for giving us the space. I would love to thank our uh, five wonderful speakers, and I know you will love them and what they have to say regarding women, technology, and leadership. I want to thank our chapter lead, Sylvia. I want to thank our co founder, Charlene. And I want to thank everybody, even the, 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 the volunteers in Kenya that I've called through this program together. I want to thank all of you for supporting, for helping, for standing up. For design programs and to put together events that will help grow women in tech Africa. If your organization is struggling in um, helping attract uh, diversity in your technology staff, by all means reach out to us. We have a, a, a large number of women in our organization. We will, we will help you find the, the right Women. We're, we're also happy to work with corporates to design diversity programs, um, programs and packages to help women. In, thank you all and enjoy the rest of the evening. Oh, yes, so um, that was a brief welcome speech from our uh, co founder, Ifda Kofi from Ghana. And what we really stress in women in tech is the diversity of the women we have. And we cannot relate to the fact that the very many women across Africa doing a lot of work to empower young girls or to empower women in different ways. And to also other women who are also running businesses that also need support from other women. So our main um, our main mission and vision is to connect all these women across Africa and globally because we also launched uh, a Women in Tech Africa for the diaspora in London two months ago and bringing all these women together in different support. So as I said, my name is Charlene Miguel. Um, what inspired Ethan and I to start Women in Tech Africa is because we were part of a program called the Young African Leaders, YALI. That was an exchange program uh, that started last year and through YALI we were able to to bring a lot of networks, young African leaders across Africa. And through that, um, we were able to, for personally, I run an IT business and I've been able to expand to South Africa and West Africa just purely through the network of Yali. And I realized that, we realized that why could African women be able to access such opportunities, not just through Yali, but through our own initiatives that we have begun. Um, with that said, um, maybe I'll just give you a few um, pointers. Um, our hashtag for today is WIT Nairobi. And if you are having problems connecting to the internet, please connect to I have to, not I have to. I have to, and the, and the password is I have Nairobi. With that, I would like to introduce um, our Kenyan chapter. Women in Tech Africa, um, as she said, has been launched in 30 African countries. And as I said before, we stress on the fact that. Um, we believe in diversity. As today I was speaking um, to I was speaking <laughs> to a lady who was telling me more about how we women, with women in tech are just not women who come up with brilliant uh, ideas, right? The women in tech who maybe work for the bigger IT companies who have their own um, problems to go through or who are trying to find better ways to perform at work. Women in tech has evolved to um, a um, different landscape and that's where women in tech Africa is going and finding ways of how to incorporate more women who have not been incorporated in women's societies before. So with that, I'd like to introduce Sylvia Mukasa, who's our country leader. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ali. 
Good evening, everyone. It's really exciting to see all of you here today, uh, joining hands with us to launch the Kenya chapter of Women in Tech Africa. I just want to share with you the reason why I support this launch today. Um, last year, I was picked as an emerging leader from Africa in the Middle East, um, and I went on a program called Tech Women. Uh, this was an initiative uh, that was started by Hillary Clinton um, as part of um, the Obama administration. This was in 2011, and it was a way to, um, to, it was a way to give uh, women mentorship, especially women in technology. So uh, women are picked um, every year. Um, up to this year, uh, we have 21 countries, and there's a list of them, um, of the participating countries in the women in, uh, in the tech women program. So um, what does women do? You're sent to a company in the Silicon Valley or San Francisco Bay Area, and then you work on a project um, for about five weeks and get mentorship on it. And while I was at the Silicon Valley, uh, one thing I saw was the vibrancy um, in terms of what the women there do. And I felt uh, we need something like that in Kenya. And this is why when I saw uh, Women in Tech Africa have this opportunity to uh, launch into other countries, I opted to request EFL and uh, the rest of the founders to have a Kenya chapter. And this is why we stand here today. Uh, just like uh, what EFL said in her speech, um, at the moment, um, Women in Tech Africa is in 500, uh, sorry, has 500 members and is in 30 countries. Not all of them have chapters, but uh, we are working towards that. So Kenya is among actually the past few that are launching local chapters because I feel we need local representation and I strongly support the idea that women need to network, uh, they need to be entrepreneurs and they need a platform for mentorship and we hope uh, you will get that through um, being members or just um, attending our events in Kenya. Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, without um, wasting much time, uh, we'll go straight into the speakers. Our first speaker for today uh, is Lynette Kwamboka. And I'll just uh, go through her bio. Uh, Lynette is the founder and CEO of Data Science Limited, a software engineering company focused on creating intelligent information systems for data analytics, aggregation, and collection. She is on the forefront of coordinating the Kenya Open Data for the Government of Kenya, recently recognized as a finalist Global Open, open Data Champion by the ODA, ODI Bloomberg Open Data Awards, and previously at the World Bank for the World Bank Sport Award recipient. Lynette has been a software engineer at Carnegie Mellon University, Pittsburgh, and she is an undergraduate degree. She has an undergraduate degree in computer science from the University of Nairobi with a keen focus on the awareness of using data for business intelligence, decision making, and resource allocation. She is a recognized and sound hero by the American Embassy in Kenya in her efforts to encourage more women into the technology and computing space. So can we put our hands together for Thank you very much. It's always amazing to hear someone read us your Good evening, everyone. Um, as you've heard, my name is Lena Tomboka. Uh, I don't know if there's any more to say after that. But I also feel that I'm under a lot of pressure to make sure that I create a very good first impression um, and to us to all my fellow speakers. So I hope um, they're not here, and if they are. Um, I don't know where to start. Uh, I, I think mine is, um, is a complex but very simple story um, about how I started, where I started, and where I am today. Um, I'm the last born child of a family of eight children, five girls and three boys. I was born in the village, very proud, Yamira County. Um, my parents were both teachers, uh, but my mom opted for the stay-at-home uh, business, which meant she was in care of eight children. But my mom started um, her business when she was 27, 
I think she had three children at that point. Um, today she has two branches. She runs a butter shop. And I grew up in a family where I saw a very strong woman taking care of eight children, running a business, um, doing farming, employing people. I grew up uh, in a place where um, I had an auntie who wanted me to become a nun because she, she was a nun. And she drove a Land Rover 110, not the one everyone likes. So I was very young when I saw a lot of these things back in the village. Um, I you know, went to primary school. Um, my friend Marie uh, put her in the sports and I used to have this thing where we say, Sisi was just a DEB. You know what DEB is? District Education Board Schools. We grew up in, at least I, I don't know about her, but I grew up in that system. I went to Yamira Primary, Yamira DEB Primary School. And then I went to high school, then I went to college, and I remember the first very strong, interesting woman that I met that actually changed my life. Uh, I'm putting someone else on the spot here, was Juliana Rotich, that I met when I was in college, uh, in my final year. And I started to see the possibilities of being a woman, really, and just being able to do things. So it wasn't, I like to say, mine is not very special. So it wasn't a very, uh, started from the bottom now here. It was a very, I grew up seeing strong women. So I thought, why not? So, you know, people ask, so how did you decide to start a business? I was like, I didn't quite decide. It was kind of made for me, you know. I saw my mother doing that and, technically making a lot more money than my dad. Uh, so for me, it was really, I grew up seeing possibilities in women doing things. So I never had that challenge of, um, I'm a woman, it's going to be hard, it's going to be this or that. As you've heard, um, I did, I, my background is in software engineering and computer science, although I haven't written code in a while. A while is one year. Um, and I've had opportunities, you know, I went to Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon University, which is one of the best, you know, software engineering universities in the world. And I did really amazing things. And I come back home and I look at it and I say, I want to start a business. And sometimes I say it's unfair for me to say, you should go ahead and start a business. Because I say, I'm the last one in a family of eight. So I told my siblings, if anything goes wrong, I'll come, you know, live in your house. So, but I also had a challenge for myself. When I got back from the States, um, there was a lot of pressure for me to go back to school. And I said, I'm not a very good student. Uh, I'm an average student, normally, but I don't do very well in exams. I don't do very well when I'm being examined. So I said, I either go to school or I start a business. And I said, um, if I start a business, I have to make sure it works. If it doesn't work, I have to go to school. So every time I felt like it was not working, I had to work really hard because I was not going back to school. Um, early this year, I started feeling like, okay, it's been real school thoughts. I am possibly never coming back to school. Uh, now I have to grow a business, so I run a company. I started Data Science Limited um, in 2013, uh, and the inspiration was really, I've worked for the World Bank, did ICT, GIS, data projects for them. I work for the government of Kenya, I still do. I'm the project coordinator for the Kenya Open Data Initiative, if you heard of that. Um, I still actually do work for the World Bank right now. Um, and for me it was, you know, when I just got back, I had interesting offers from interesting, very big companies um, to go and help them do the information systems. And I had three very amazing offers. And these offers to me came in the form of Here's the job description. Here's how much we'll pay you. When can you start? I like to say I have actually never been interviewed uh, and I have been working since I was 17. So for me, it was, it was almost like it was handed to me. And I say, I can take that and do it. I can choose Google over IBM or, you know, something else over IBM or Google or something else about this. And then the other people are going to hate me because I know them, so what if I start a company, no one can fault me for that, then maybe I can work with these guys. And somehow along the way, I've managed to be able to convert them at some level into clients or partners. Um, one of the things that we like to talk about is our failures and our challenges. And 
I'm listening to a very interesting podcast that I'm sending to a lot of people now. It's called Free Economics. Um, my aspirations in life, uh, as of two weeks ago, has become an economist. Um, and there's one thing they are talking about this morning, about this guy who won the challenge of eating hot dogs. So he ate the most number of hot dogs in the least number of time. I think it was like 50 hot dogs in a minute, or something like that. And they said something quite interesting about him. Um, and they say the record before that was 25 hot dogs, yeah, but he ate 50. And you know, uh, so the podcast uh, guy is called uh, Stephen Dubner, and he said if he had concentrated about the 25, that was the last record, he would have probably ate 28. He's like, I'm past the record, I'm just going to eat two more and I'm good, right? But he did not think about that. So I like to not think about the challenges. Every time um, people ask me, so what challenges do you face as a woman in technology? I say, let me tell you about my successes in state. I don't want to talk about the challenges. There, there, there's many challenges. Um, I, I, I don't know how this sounds with the theme of today, but I'm going I'm to say that, that I feel like sometimes we focus a lot more on failure. Uh, so what's your failure in starting a company? If you meet me and the first thing I'm telling you is about failure in running a software engineering or data analytics company, and if you wanted to start that, then I'm telling you, oh, you know what, clients don't pay, or sometimes you don't get talent, or sometimes you don't get this. I'm kind of grounding you in that. So if you wanted to start, if you wanted to do something, the first thing you think about is clients are not going to pay, so I can't do that. I'll tell you about my successes, and I think I have done pretty well over the past two years. You know, We've had uh, the International Trade Center as a client. For me, that was one of those things. I go to the, you know, to my office and I scream a bit and hope everyone else cannot hear me. Don't tell everyone, that's what I do. <laughs> um, but I have been able to do, you know, things that for me sometimes I think are ordinary until you meet someone who says, oh my God, you were able to do that. Um, you know, over the past two years, I've been able to meet interesting people. Uh, we've been able to do amazing work for amazing people. Um, I'm at a point where I'm invited to speak to you guys, you know, um, just out of the things that we've done, you know, being recognized by Bloomberg. First of all, when that happened, I was like, oh, you know, that's great. Well, I've been in this open data business for a while, so it's kind of expensive. And then I meet my friend who says, do you know what that means? You need to update your CV now. You need to update your profile. Actually, I think Sylvia will bear witness that I actually sent her second uh, profile after the first one that had that. So I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, it's just, I said, it's Bloomberg. It's the Open Data Institute. You know, these are the people who are recognizing your work. Do you see what that means? And I said, okay, maybe if you say it's a big deal, it's a big deal. Um, today, I was going to leave the office and come here, and then someone, you know, sent me a message and said, oh my God, you're speaking at this event, you know, I would have really wished to come and hear you speak. This is so awesome. So I was under so much pressure to go home and change. Like, you know, it's, it's something. So for me, it's really been, you know, meeting very interesting people. I, I would say, you know, when I met Juliana many years ago, and I started off at the IHA. Uh, straight out, uh, straight out of uh, high school, college, I start here with many people. We did amazing things. You know, there's the Akirachi women who I've worked with before, um, who do really amazing things. So for me, just going back and looking at those things, then I realize you can do it. Really, there's nothing that says you're a woman in technology uh, that you should have these challenges or shouldn't. Challenges are there. You know, um, one of the signal me when I'm. Speak all night. Um, yesterday, the, the podcast I was listening to, these guys were interviewing the president of Harvard. I didn't even know the president of Harvard was a woman. You know, I was like, yeah, you go women. Um, and then, you know, he was asking her, so, you know, how is it being uh, the Harvard woman president? And she said, listen, I'm not the Harvard woman president. I am the Harvard president. I was like, yes, ma'am. That's, you know. Um, I like to say a lot of the people I hang out with, and this is a bit personal, are men. For a reason that I'm going to explain. You meet a man and typical linen, I'm awesome. I'm good. You know? A man wants something, he's gonna tell you. 
I like to give a, a silly example of you all dressed up one morning, you decide to walk by the construction site, and this watchman at the construction site says, Madame Naluna Kapoor, and you're like, really? That shouldn't be coming from you. I was hoping for that other, but uh, a man will always tell you what he thinks. He thinks he's awesome, he's awesome, you know? Um, lately, I like to say something which is also silly, but which I'll encourage you to say, which is sometimes modesty is for the weak. I know. It sounds strong, but I'm just going to say it. We like to downplay the things that we do. We like to downplay the, our strengths and the things that we are up to. Um, and you meet someone who, and someone say the problem with the world is that the clever people are not confident and the stupid people are very confident. Yeah? So you meet people who are not doing anything, who are really not doing anything, and they can sell themselves and you can see it and you say, wow. And sometimes you think about the things you've done where you're like, no, you know, I won't even talk about that. It's not good enough. Like, I won't do that. And I will tell you the reason why I have the confidence of saying that is over the past one year, when I started talking about the things that I do, you know, I had people introduce me and they talk about the things that I do. And I'm like, are we still talking about me? Oh, yeah, I actually really did that. And then I realized that whenever people introduce me, I actually get more people contacting me than when I introduce myself. Because when I introduce myself, I'm like, oh, I'm Lynette, and I sometimes run this company called Data Science, and uh, so what do you know, you know? But when people introduce me, they're like, okay, stop. So she's Lynette, she's Dandy, she's Dandy, she works for the company, she works for the world, she works for this, she runs the company, she, you know, she employs people, she does this. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's actually me. And before you know, someone's like, we should talk. I think, I think you're interesting, you know? Um, over the past year, I used to be the very... If I don't know you, I'm not so snob, but I'm maybe not going to speak to you. And lately, I walk up to CEOs and I say, hi, I'm Lynette, and I am the CEO of Data Science Limited. CEO to CEO, let's talk. And before you know it, you know, everyone is like, oh. And sometimes you have to name drop. I like to tell my friends, you know, you're in a conversation and people are like, oh, what does she know? And I'm like, you know, when I was at CMU, I'm like, Oh, you want to see a new? Let's talk. And unfortunately, sometimes that's just how it happens. So the things about you and I find that about women that we actually do not bring out. Talk about your successes. You know, there was this joke on Chachu Live. I won't believe that. And this guy said the problem with women is you walk up to her and you say, "Oh my God, you have nice shoes," and she said, "Well, they sometimes kind of hurt." And I'm like, she just say thank you and move on. You know, that's all you needed to say. Sometimes someone compliments what you're good at, and the first thing you look at is fault. You know, I'm not saying that you should gloat and, you know, forget that you have some weakness or something. Just, there's no, there's no fault in knowing at the back of your mind that you're teachable, that you're open to learning, and bringing out the best. Sometimes people just want to hang out with success stories. You know, if you're always the one who's complaining, if you're always the one who's like, oh, things don't work out, listen, things don't work out very many times. And I like to say, sometimes, you know, we like to say, oh, everyone should become an entrepreneur. And it's easy for me now to say, not everyone can become an entrepreneur. There's, there's times at 12 a.m., I am up, yeah, 12 a.m. is really late for me. And I'm thinking, so, you know, how are we going to pay this rent this month? Where are we going to pay the people from? But then I go to the office in the morning and the first thing I know is I'm grateful for my team because without them, nothing would be happening, yeah? This afternoon I was reading something, you know, one of those quotes that says, if you don't build your dreams, you'll help someone else build theirs. And a lot of times it's used to criticize people for not becoming entrepreneurs. I say, not everyone's dream is to become an entrepreneur. Maybe your dream is to just become good at what you are already, you know, now. So go ahead and do that. There's nothing that stops you. So my story is just that, you know. Um, I don't think, you know, sometimes when I say, and I grew up in the village, and a lot of people will be like, oh my God, yours is a really good success story. I'm like, no, you tell that to my parents, and they're like, we have seven others. Uh, <laughs> she's not that special. You know, there are times I would call my dad and be like, I was in the newspaper. Uh, the latest one happened in April of this year, and I 
drove down all the way. It was like a five hour drive. And I was like, on oh, Saturday morning, I'll buy two you know, copies of the newspaper and then I open them in front of my dad. Um, and I was so proud. Oh my God, dad, see, you know, I'm on the papers. And he's like, huh, that's great. So what are we doing today? I came all the way, you know. I am here and I'm on the peppers, but so sometimes you know you look at things like those for me, and I never let the fact that I grew up in a different circumstance than my friends hinder me, really. You know, um, whenever people talk about their very amazing Alliance High School experience, their very amazing Precious Blood experience. I say, well, you know, I used to be very good in tennis in high school. I was actually Kenya three at a point, like with that, you know. So I would say let's not use our backgrounds against ourselves. Let's not use I'm a woman, you know. Um, there was this campaign by Nike, it was, you know, where they were, had these kids who said, you know, what does it mean when you say kick like a woman? Oh, like a girl, you hit like a girl. And I said, growing up, my mom used to say, sit like a girl. And what she meant is, you're a girl, you should be better than that. You know? When someone told me like a girl, for me it meant, I'm giving myself ordinary when I should be super ordinary. So I, I have just never looked at things from a very challenging point of view. And when I look at people and the people that I meet, that's what they tell me. My friends, generally, we don't talk about the challenges. We talk about successes and how to move. And I have found that that changes a lot of things. The final thing I would say is, uh, I think two years ago, in 2013, um, there was an event in this same room, and I was asked to speak. Uh, and I remember I was doing an experiment at that point on how the negative and the positive actually affect the way we think. And during that time, so I took out three girls and I told them three stories. I said to one, um, there's this girl who's 26, she works at Safaricom, she's just been promoted to become a manager. And at that time, I, okay, I won't reveal my age. But, and I said, so I told the three that, and to one I said, go think about it and I'll give you three minutes to tell me about that girl. Who is she? What does she do? What do you think her background is? No, 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 no. To one, I said, really? She's 26 and she just became a manager? Mm, you know, girls these days do all sorts of crazy things to get ahead. Um, you know, anyway, you go think about that. You have three minutes to tell me about this girl. And to the other, I said, women these days are ambitious. You know, they are successful. They finish school and they do all these things. So I don't think it's impossible, really, for a woman at 26 to become a manager. It's, very, it's not, not something so tough. Anyway, you go think about that. So they each had three minutes. And the one I did not influence at all came back and said, yeah, I think this woman is really ambitious. She's, you know, she, she might be a loner, but she's worked really hard. She was probably, you know, the very smart girls in school. The one I told, really? You think so? And she came in and she said, I think she slept with someone. I think she definitely did, you know, something. I mean, at 26, no, there's no way. The one I influenced positively came in and said, you know, she's, she's ambitious. There's nothing wrong with that. She is, she's very good. She must be really smart. In fact, in two years, I think she's going to make senior management. So that is what those things do to us. When we focus on the failures and the challenges, and they ground us into a point where we might not be able to stand up, and we need to stand up. So as a woman in technology, for me, what it is is try and focus on the success. <laughs> try and look at, you know, um, I had four years where each year I would pick a woman I wanted to be like. So that year, I would stop them, I would read about them, I would, you know, meet the people I've seen them meet. I would do all those things. And that actually ended last year. And out of all that, I learned that these people do these things because they focus on what they can do, not the limitations that they have. 
So my challenge to you is focus on what you can do, not the limitations. It's not worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Minet. I'm sure you enjoyed that. Um, and if you have any questions for her, uh, she'll be here in the question and answer session, so you can ask about that. Uh, now I'll just uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, this is Angela Odor Lunati. Angela Odor is the Director of Community Engagement at Ushahidi, based in Nairobi, Kenya. Her work involves creating and managing programs for Ushahidi's diverse community, as well as mentoring members of Ushahidi's global open source developer ecosystem. She has experience as a software developer since 2010 to date. She is passionate about building appropriate technology tools that have impact and supporting users of all tools Ushahidi builds. She is a first class honors graduate from Strathmore University with a bachelor's degree in business information technology. She is a co-founder and director of community building at Akiritrix, a non-profit organization that nurtures generations of women building solutions for Africa using technology through training, mentorship, networking, and outreach. Let's put our hands together for Angela. Hey guys. Hi. Um, I hope I'm, I'm going to try not to take too much of your time or bore you too much with my story. Um, but like she said, my name is Angie. I wear two hats. I work at Ushahidi, but I'm also a co founder at Akira Chicks. So, these kind of events, trying to get more women involved in the tech industry, is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, both my parents are engineers, so I've always known from a very young age that I wanted to do some sort of engineering course, but I wasn't really quite sure which path to take. So I decided to double a little bit into, into programming when I got to Strathmore back in 2010. Um, and I think my mind was blown when I got to learn how to program using C++. I have a very good, um, I, I have a deep interest in math. Being able to apply logic and seeing that applying in a formula to solve a problem, it makes me extremely happy. So being behind your terminal, being behind whatever, you know, your computer to actually build something made me really, really excited. Um, and then back in 2010, I met a lady called Jessica Colasso, uh, who's a really good friend of mine. And she introduced me to the I Have. That's when the I Have was, was launching. And for me, that was, I think that, that's a pivotal moment that made, that has brought me here today. One, that's where I got to meet my amazing co-founders of Akira Chicks. Linda, Marie, please wave to the crowd. Linda, Marie, wave. <laughs> Um, and it's also where I got to meet um, the likes of Juliana and Eric Hasman, the co-founders of Ushahidi, and started my journey into volunteering for the, you know, for the open source uh, platform, which is called Ushahidi. Um, it also changed my mindset into what exactly a career in tech would look like. Because for me, it was, you know, you go to school, you study computer science, you probably go and work for an organization where you sit behind a desk, make your money, and you leave. But here was this open space that had people who you would term as misfits coming together, building tech that was making a difference across the entire world without having to put on a suit, without having, you know, you have to work from nine to five. The focus was really on what skills do you have? How are you applying it? And how are we making a difference in the world out there? How are you using those skills to make a difference in your communities? So that's, that was pretty powerful for me. Um, I started off as an intern at the iHub. I did a little bit of software development for them, as well as um, managing a few of their events. Um, while at the same time, building up a career trip with Marie, Linda, Judith, and the rest of the other ladies. Because one thing we noticed when the iHub started was that there were very few women in the room. Yeah, you know, you'd had one girl, a sea of guys around you. And the same thing applied even in school. Um, you're in a, in a classroom, you're put in a project, and somebody will think, since you're the chief, you go write notes and I'm like, no, 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 no. Because I know how to put, I am going to be building, you take the notes. And we wanted to build that culture as well across for everybody else. And we figured that the best way to do that is to come together, create a forum 
for us to be able to interact with each other and get to know each other. Because when you're in a group of people, you're really able to propel each other a lot further. We've noticed a lot of people falling off um, the industry because they don't know, they don't have support networks. They don't know people who are, they don't know the people who are working within the industry and they figure, you know what, I'm alone, this is difficult. Let me leave it. But when you have a support system and you're able to see other people doing the same things and it encourage you it encourages you to do that a whole lot more. Anyway, that aside, let me move on to this other part of my journey before I kind of bring it all together and show you how both of these parts have brought me to where I am today. Um, I volunteered for Shahidi for a while. Um, uh, I think it was the Uchagusi project back in 2010 for our referendum. And I got pretty excited with the code base. So I just started playing around with it. Then I joined the team in 2011 as a software developer. So I was, well, I am a hardcore techie. I know I've been moved off the code, but I, I still claim that, that title. I am a hardcore techie. I would, you know, fix bugs, build features on the core platform with Linda, who also works at Ushahidi. But then I would also apply my people, my, my people skills on the other side by supporting our users, trying to understand, you know, what bug, you know, what problems are you facing and guiding them through that. So I do a lot of customer support and trainings, which also helped me a whole lot to understand what the platform was like. It, it was a it was a good way of learning. Um, similarly, at Akira Chicks, when we started off, I was that girl who was, you know, helping to support build the website, setting up our, our, our emails and everything. So a bit of the technical side, but also still building up on um, organizing the meetups. Over time, gradually, I got yanked out of that space. I got yanked out and pushed a lot more into interacting with people. And I resisted that for a while, because for me, even though we would go out there and talk to people and tell them, you know, you don't have to be a hardcore programmer. I felt like me moving away from my terminal and my computer screen doesn't make me that hardcore of a techie, right? I, I had always had this idea that I'd always be behind that screen because let's, let's face it, dealing with uh, code sometimes tends to be much easier than dealing with people because it's just a matter of you apply, it's logic. You have A plus B equals C. And it's very easy for you to solve the problem. With people, it's a lot more different. You have to understand what their cultures are like. You have to understand the person's personality and figure out the best way of delivering something before you can actually get to the point where you solve the problem. But then with time, as things, you know, uh, as, as time moved on, I realized, you know, it, there's a quote that is said at Ushahidi a whole lot that runs through in my head. It's not always about the technology. It's not always about the tech. The tech is this one piece of it. What's the other side of it? And this is where my journey at Ushahidi and Akira Chicks kind of merges together. Because I look at myself as a bridge. I understand the tech speak, but then I'm also able to understand the people who don't understand that side of the world and bring them together to become a much more powerful force. Right? And this is why I think even in the work that we do with Akira Chicks, when we're doing high school outreach and everything, we're trying to advocate for women take, women using technology to solve problems within their communities in whatever way possible. You don't have to be a programmer. You don't have to be a designer, right? You know, we know of tech researchers. We know of poets who are using technology in, in, in interesting ways. That still makes you a techie. So I embrace that, and I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm happier where I am um, because I'm able. I feel like. I'm able to, I'm a much more powerful force right now by being able to connect these groups because of the other second lesson. Um, I'm bringing these groups together to collaborate because at the end of the day, when you're alone, you will go faster, but when you're many people, you go further, right? The key to success will really involve you standing on the shoulders of giants. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there's somebody who's doing something interesting, go find them, find a way of working together. And that has also been a very huge key to success for us at Ushahidi and Akira Chicks, working with different groups like the I have, working with groups that have different skill sets, you know, just finding ways of connecting with each other and even looking at what the I have has done today, having an open space like this and that brings together people from different, you know, from different mindsets. You have business mentors, you have programmers, you have designers coming together and applying those skills to solve real problems in their, in their communities. <laughs> <laughs> give me a minute to take, take a small break. So I talked about you know one technology not being the you know technology not it, it not being just about the technology. Two openness and collaboration. 
three, the other thing which ties into building appropriate technology, making sure that we're not, we're always thinking about the problem we're trying to solve and then applying whatever skill, skill set is applicable in that case, right? Letting your audience be your guide. Um, looking at how Ushahidi started and how Akirajik started, it all stemmed from a specific problem in our communities that we were trying to solve, right? At that moment, it was, we are few women in the room. How exactly do we bring them together to get to the point where we're, we're encouraging more of them to take up careers in tech? And that has morphed over the last five years into four specific programs, right? We have training, we have mentorship, we have outreach, and we have community building, networking opportunities. With Ushahidi, it started off with, you know, um, uh, there's violence breaking out in different parts of the country. We don't know what's going on. Let's create a platform that will allow ordinary citizens to pull in information, rather send in information, and have that available to everybody. And over the last seven years, we've seen it used more than 60,000 times in more than 160 countries. A tool that was built out of problems that are generally um, associated with Africa, low bandwidth, bad governance, that is being used in places like Nepal, because it all started with us thinking about who our audience is and what the end goal is, and then applying the tech. So it's not about, you know, this looks like it's a very funky idea, you know, I want to build the next amazing mobile application. No, it's about what problem are you solving? What's the problem in this specific situation and how do I apply the tech to move, um, to solve that problem in that case? Right. <laughs> There's an interesting question that Sylvia asked me to um, incorporate into my talk, which is, what does leadership look like uh, for me? And I know that this is a very big question, especially for women in the tech industry. What exactly does leadership look like to you? Because all of us are aspiring to be leaders in this industry. I think, and this is embodied a whole lot by the team that I work with and all the mentors and everybody who works in this, in this space, it all starts with, solving problems in our community, building for the, for the purpose of other people, in service of others, serving. That is how you end up leading. It's not about you, you know, pointing out this is what's going wrong. It's about figuring out how you're a part of the solution and leading that into the, into the best uh, segue moving forward. How can you, the other question that Sylvia asked was, how can we get to the point where um, what opportunities exist out there for us? What do you need to do to become that successful women, woman leader in this industry? There are a lot of opportunities that are available right now that were not available a lot, you know, in, in past in past years. We didn't have forums like these ones where we'd have women coming and speaking to us about their own personal experiences. We didn't have open spaces that would allow you to come and experiment and try and fail and pick yourself up again. We didn't have forums that would allow you to apply your technical skills, you know, hackathons and things like that. I think this is a challenge to us to sometimes not think about what's in it for me at first glance, but think about what can I do to learn a lot more. And that means look, looking outside, looking for means of engaging with people who are of a different mindset than you, looking for people who will teach you something new, participating in hackathons. That's a big one because I know for a fact, we've hosted a lot of hackathons around this space and there's always very few women around. And we ask ourselves, why is it because you don't believe that you have the skill? What is it, right? And that's a question that I'm sure we can talk about a little later. But that we really need to get to the point where we start believing in ourselves and actually start building those solutions as women, right? I think I'm at the end of my talk. <laughs> All right. Uh, now things change a little bit. Uh, we're going to have a male speaker. Uh, this is a guest speaker for, for today. Um, I participated in the GES Summit uh, in July this year. And um, this is someone I got to hear about at that event. And uh, as most of you may recall, uh, President Obama did speak about um, creating opportunities for women by establishing We Create Centers. So I'm just going to invite uh, someone who can speak to us about the We Create Centers, uh, because uh, as women and also as potential <coughs> entrepreneurs or already uh, practicing entrepreneurs, we'd like to know what opportunities exist for us. So I welcome Sean Griffin to speak to us. Yes.
<laughs> uh, it's great to be here, everybody. And uh, yes, it's true. Uh, I sat there about 100 feet away from President Obama when he announced the three We Create Centers We Are Building in Africa. And um, just to be clear, these are women entrepreneurship centers. I'll back up a little bit. I am the founder and CEO of Startup Cup. Uh, we run a global network of entrepreneurial accelerators in over 60 countries. Uh, and we are, now, and I'm the co-founder of WeCreate, the initiative, um, which is a public-private partnership with the United States Department of State. And um, we are growing a global web network of uh, women entrepreneurship centers, which we call WeCreate centers. Uh, they are designed to support empowering any woman, any background, any education level to design, test, and build a business, as well as supporting many of the gender issues that women face. Um, as they're going about their lives, but in particular, trying to grow a business. Uh, the, the, you're probably wondering, why the heck is a guy up here, a man up here talking about women and centers, and how did I get involved in co-founding this? Um, so I'm, I'm the opposite. I, I grew up around women. All, all, all my life, uh, mostly older women. I was removed and kicked out of 12 schools by the time I was a sophomore in high school, prime candidate for a serial entrepreneur. And so what that means was I was around women all the time because my mother and her friends and, and their work, and I grew up in California. And so um, it, it didn't really click with me at first, but I grew up with women. Women have been the greatest influence in my life. Uh, when we launched Startup Cup, we started uh, seeing women rising to the top. They may have been a lower percentage in our this five to seven month competitive process. How you advance in our programs, it's built on a business model curriculum. How you advance is by advancing into the marketplace, progressing, creating customers, generating revenue. And what we'd see is women were a fairly low percentage of the participants, but they would rise to the top and they would become the first, second, and sometimes third place winners in countries where they're operating with startup cups. And we started digging into it, figuring out what's going on, what do we have happening here. And what we discovered is women make better entrepreneurs, at least the ones that go through our programs. And that is based upon them being more collaborative, more team-oriented, many of the things that were being set up here, um, more focused on long-term rewards, that is, they're not instant gratification like men are. They have stronger internal intestinal fortitude, that means they naturally have a built-in strength that makes them willing to power through the difficult process of designing, testing, and building a business. And that led to, hey, we've got something here. Let's, let's focus more on women. And that really was the start. And then working with um, co-founder of We Create with me, Tanya Heipel, who's the senior advisor to women entrepreneurship at the Department of State. We sat down, we hatched this idea, and uh, now we, we've got six of them being developed. Um, we've launched in Pakistan. Um, it's been operating for seven months. We've got Zambia running now for three months. And we're going to be launching in November the We Create Center in Lavington. Did I get it right? Lavington. In November. Um, the key thing here is that, and first of all, before I go any further, I'd love to introduce the leadership of the We Create Kenya Center who are here. Would you, would you all stand up, please? We've got Audrey, Liz, and um, Esther who are here, and they are going to be the ones you're going to connect with. Um, if you're interested in learning more, they are the leadership and staff who will be running the center. Which, by the way, if we didn't rent the center, where we're going to be set up, I, I was thinking of moving to Nairobi. This place is absolutely incredible. <laughs> uh, honestly, and absolutely, you're going to love it. So the key thing here with um, the We Create Center is we're open to any type of business idea. Critical, as long as it's legal. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons we started, also one of the reasons we started seeing larger percentages of women participating in our program because it wasn't all about technology. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this for a second. That is this, what percentage of startups globally have a technology play at the core of their business model? Anybody know? No idea? 2%. 2% of all startups around the world have a technology play at the core of their business model. That means 98% of all startups and businesses around the world do not have technology at the core of their business model. 
One of the things we're doing with the WeCreate Center is figuring out how to enable technology for startups, no matter what their business is, to make them more competitive. So I think what's important as we look at iHub and WeCreate, uh, the WeCreate Center is understanding how we adapt the technology to make the women who are starting businesses that are not technology at the core of their business model to be more competitive by leveraging technology through women like yourself who are in technology. The core goal of We Create is to increase the quality and quantity of entrepreneurs, and we do that by working on developing local mentors who are champions of women and who understand how to mentor and support women entrepreneurs. There is a difference. So all of our training and development we do at the center is to help those that support the center understand how to be more effective at supporting women entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. We have a portfolio of programs uh, that are a combination of events, but can help take someone from an idea to an operating business uh, in a 15-week program. We have a six to seven month acceleration program. We have workshops that help you build businesses within three hours, also over weekends. We have pitch sessions, and then we're plugging into all the different service providers and other supporters of entrepreneurship within Nairobi and Kenya as a whole to um, have them plug their programs into the center. So if you are really interested in starting a business and want some support in terms of the technical elements, it's not just about starting a business. It's fairly easy. Uh, it's hard to build it. It takes 18 to 30 months to go from an idea to first profitability. We focus on the hard stuff, the heavy lifting, the ability to build the business, and then provide the networks and support to help you do that. Um, I think that I, I, there's a couple themes we have that are important. Um, I've already said that women make better entrepreneurs. We believe that strongly, and we see that our data shows it. Last year, we worked with 6,500 startups around the world, so those are the ones we touch, coach, work with. Pretty interesting data around that as well, and it continually women rise to the top, which is really exciting for us. Uh, but nothing, and it was, it was it's a theme that continues to happen here, uh, that was a theme that we've heard from the two other presenters, and nothing of greatness happens without a team. So this is number one. Team is essential. Women make and are able to build teams better, collect people. So one of the key things that has to be understood is you have to have a team. Uh, we spend a lot of time and energy training how to develop a team, how to tap your own networks, and you already have access to teams and how to collect people. So that's one of the things you learn. And that is not something that's taught in many places around the world, team development, team building. Also, what percentage of startups around the world receive funding, traditional funding, venture capital funding, angel funding, accelerator funding? Anybody have an idea? It just came out earlier this year. I can't remember. It was March, maybe. It used to be 2%. It's now 1%. 1% of all startups are receiving funding. So what does that mean? You need to create revenue. You don't need funding. You need revenue. Revenue is your funding. And so we put a lot of energy and effort into revenue generation as the key to, and repeatable customers as the key to being successful at building a business. And our model and methodology is built around making money in hours, not days, not weeks. So we can show and teach entrepreneurs and share knowledge on how to create revenue rapidly. That's even if you don't have a product, we can show you how to pre-sell and then how to take that money you generate from the pre-sale to reinvest in the business. Um, so it, again, it, it's open to any, uh, any type of idea. Uh, we'll be opening in November and, um, I'm very excited about being here in Nairobi and seeing uh, the success we've had match what we've seen in Zambia. So just to give you an idea, Zambia has open, been open three months, 2,500 women entrepreneurs have gone through the programming, have been coached and mentors, they're weekly, daily coaching sessions. We have these things called startup tune-ups where mentors come in and work with these entrepreneurs. Um, pretty incredible. There's there's belief here that, that we'll have greater numbers and impact here in Nairobi as, as things go forward. So uh, we look forward to seeing that uh, unfold. And we'll also be helping plug in, and it is a global network, so we will be um, actually connecting entrepreneurs from different countries and working on creating cross-pollination and collaborations as, as, as um, you want to build a business. I can answer, answer more questions when we come up on the panel. Thank you very much. Um, uh,
to introduce the next speaker, uh, who's Wamboi Kinya. Wamboi is our Managing Director of Potworks Africa. Potworks is a community of personal individuals whose purpose is to revolutionize software design, creation, or delivery, and advocating for positive social change. Wamboi is responsible for the strategic evolution of the business for partnering with clients to help them to get a competitive position through the use of disruptive technology for developing people and collectively growing uh, their pan-African business. Wamboi has been in the professional services, uh, digital and mobile marketing and technology consulting <coughs> industry for well over 15 years and has worked in North America, Europe and Africa for companies such as Precalc Consulting, IBM Global Business Services, and Digitize. We're not traveling to work, Wamboi is often traveling for fun. So let's welcome Wamboi Kenya. Hi everyone. Hi. Good to see some familiar faces. Um, I have this special to me. Um, when I was with Precalc, I started off with a desk that was on the left, <laughs> and slowly we grew and grew and, and found a space um, within this building. But um, really honored and privileged to be here as part of Women in um, Technology Africa, um, in Tech Africa, sorry. Um, we've got a bit of a relationship <laughs> um, that also started in um, London. Um, Fortworks, um, as introduced, um, is quite passionate um, about community. And we truly do believe in being able to make um, a socially and economically just world through software, which we're really good at. Um, I guess I was um, guided to share a little bit of my stories. I'm gonna, I have notes that I can keep it to 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so I started off, I guess, technology for me started off um, out of trying to prove the boys wrong. Um, I was at that point, <laughs> I was at that point um, in my studies, I wouldn't age myself too, too much. Um, when you get to um, choose, are you going the humanities way or are you going the science way? And um, that kills me, we still have to do that. But anyhow, um, it was assumed that um, being the bubbly, vivacious young one boy that I was, I was going to go the, um, the humanities way. Um, and so to prove the boy that had told me this wrong, I was like, no, absolutely. Um, and chose physics, chemistry, and math as my um, A levels. And but, but I always found that I related better to things that were factual and had very little memory power for simply just um, memorizing and regurgitating. So um, when did France conquer wherever? It just didn't seem to resonate in my mind. <laughs> I could work better with formulas and figure out how to, um, to work my way through them. Um, but um, as life took it, I ended up in um, the US and did computer science and economics and then was also to prove another guy wrong, who was a professor, who was a bit of a racist Afrikaans, who was um, only ever spoke of Africa as if we were doomed. So um, to challenge him and to make sure that there was another narrative in the course, I took all his courses. And then ended up with an economics degree as well. Um, <laughs> so, um, but in terms of women in technology, um, it became quite clear to me that something was happening when the company I worked for um, was in Boston. Um, not too many um, black developers, let alone developers from Africa, and also not too many women developers. And I was selected onto a project that a lot of people were trying to get onto because the lead architect was this very revered um, engineer um, from NASA who had just amazing, amazing stories to tell about his experiences and of course the evolution of um, code and developing and this was aging myself once more when Java was now the big it thing, right? <laughs> so an object-oriented programming. But no matter what I did, I could come into the office at six o'clock in the morning, have people look at my code, let me know how they thought of it. It didn't really matter. Um, there was always a comment, even just small, small things. Just he would find not amount of space in between lines of code. I, it was just always um, 
it was it was an, an undermining that began to sort of settle that question of doubt can i really do this um and it got to a point where one of the male developers um suggested one day why don't you give i'll give you my code to check in you give me your code to check in and then let's see what happens and of course his name was chris the nasa engineer was jim jim stood up and could not stop talking about chris's code so chris stood up and said well funny you should mention it but um because even chris never ever got any kudos anyway <laughs> but the code the code is one boys and he wouldn't believe it and he, to the point where he was challenging us to take us to hr because we were lying and, and making him look bad um but thankfully for great leadership in that particular organization i did stay with them for a while because they really wanted to make sure that it was clear that women and particularly women who were from minority um populations were most welcome and encouraged to grow but it never really resonated to me what had actually happened i think after several years and i was sort of at that crossroads of should i try go the architect way or maybe everyone all the women that i sort of started with and got to know a little bit all seem to be moving towards being business analysts and project managers and do i really want to stick with this um and then i was um a part of a program that tries to keep um well bluntly black people in boston <laughs> um <laughs> and there i met um some fellow engineers um women engineers and when we got to share and we got to actually speak very honestly and very truthfully and very emotionally about some of the things we were experiencing it actually created some strength and that's why i think for me um organizations like women in tech africa are quite important um to create that forum to be able to share to be able to network and and figure out who else is out there that might have influence to begin to figure out not only for ourselves and I like what Angela was saying before it's less about me and my journey and sort of me and the ability to be able to create a journey for others and that's quite important but it was there that I began to see and I recognize this in um at Fortwex um diversity is less of a numbers game it's actually core to who we are our leadership is made up of 50% women well represented between global north global south um our incoming consultants um we have a program called Fortbrex University um but must always be 50% women and this is part of our 20 year vision we might not be able to find the women now but we're definitely going to have the women in the future and but what i find even talking to some of the women developers in Fortbrex is that that, that niggling doubt that sort of starts to settle in even when you're sort of in amongst others that may not have the same confidence starts to sort of become a bit of a cancer um and i think it's important as women to support each other even in those moments of doubt so it's okay to veer out of technology and stop coding i'm not saying that that is the only way but basically to say that i think use each other um to be able to figure out where when the doubt is coming is that coming out of a place of perhaps a little bit of self esteem crushed from an interaction or is that something that is maybe data that that is worthy of you now absorbing and then being able to to work through um i do think that there is a responsibility that we do have um and I'll because the truth of it is when you think when you look at it there are many organizations I think Akira Chicks is one that that I know we've always so Fortworks just for context um has been in Africa about 3 years um we call Africa our experiment only because the way we've established in Africa is different to all other regions this was created as an entity that was going to be run by Africans for Africans with Africans as well as others we're internationalists first but also very proud Africans we're quite dedicated to um changing the narrative around africa when you look back at our history now that i'm talking about history um despite my <laughs> um choosing against it earlier um when you look at the history of colonialism you look at the history of post colonialism and now in the space that we're in around neoliberalism and what that is doing to us i think it's in creating making sure that we are creating and we are solving for africa and for the things that are true to our context and protecting that together 
um, so that it cannot then be taken away by others who may be um, suggesting that they're serving a different purpose, but really protecting what it is we're building and building it not just, again, for ourselves, but in terms of how it can solve for others and really thinking about it not in the context of this might solve a particular problem in Nairobi, but what Angel had spoken to before, it may very well be a solution that's then used in Nepal. Um, and to think about the constraints, um, we're 50%, I believe, between under, under the age of 50 in Kenya, we're about 50% women. If you look in um, the percentage of women in technology, it's woefully low. Um, and that has an impact even on the technology that's built for us, right? Because who is represented <laughs> when, they're, when they're building the context, whatever that's going to be developed. And I think that that's important for us to also make sure that we are part of that voice. Um, as far as, I guess, my journey, so moving away from Jim and his little crisis as far as women and African women, um, I think a very key influence for me was my mom, which might sound <laughs> very, um, and I'll speak to this. So my mother was someone who um, was, she chose to be a pharmacist and then was challenged yet again by, I keep going back to these men who keep challenging us. And at the time it was her then husband, my father. <laughs> um, so she left when I was about two years old and went to pursue a master's degree in chemical engineering to prove that it was possible for a woman to be a chemical engineer. I don't think if I asked my father today, if he would even remember the comment that caused that, that, that reaction. But for, her, but for her, in the context of, uh, I guess it was in the late 70s, um, leaving this child to go to America to go pursue further education was quite shocking. And I think shocking a lot, especially to the women that were amongst and in her family. Um, and the response she kept telling people, and today she's 68 and just got into the climate change program at Strathmore. For her, she's always looking for solving the bigger picture, even if it means for her to have to make the sacrifice of being separated from her child. So things like that have continued to motivate me in terms of how am I here to serve? How am I here to serve not as one way personally, but how am I here to serve with these amazing, beautiful faces amongst us? Um, and I really do hope that with um, Women in Tech Africa coming to Nairobi, that's the conversation we're having. So we continue to support those organizations that are helping the next generation of women. Um, so the Akira Chicks and the programs that are looking at young girls and getting them into the programs. We run a lot of community activities, even as ThoughtWorks. Um, but then also beginning to look at how do we extend um, to an organization that is Pan-African, like Women in Tech, to begin to connect with other women who have, are similarly minded, who are also aligned um, and quite committed to being able to actually make a difference and a difference that actually serves that 50% of women who are very um, woefully underrepresented in technology. I think that's all I have to share, but I am looking forward to an interactive discussion. Oh, and a small plug for ThoughtWorks, we're officially in Nairobi in November um, and really looking forward to creating a space that is um, welcoming of community activities such as this as well um, and to help transform and um, be very innovative in coming up with solutions that are built out on Nairobi. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amrote Abdella. I'll just go through her bio. Amrote is the Director of Startups, Engagement and Partnerships uh, for Africa Initiative at Microsoft. Um, sorry, I'll just say that again. Amrote um, is the Director of Startups, Engagement and Partnerships for Microsoft's for Africa Initiative, a multi-year commitment by Microsoft to actively engage in, engage in Africa's economic development to improve its global competitiveness. Prior to joining Microsoft, Amrota was in Geneva, working with the World Economic Forum as Associate Director for the Africa region, where she was responsible for key relationships and strategic initiatives with African government and business leaders. 
Prior to the World Economic Forum, Amrote was part of the World Bank in Washington, D.C., working on access to finance, focusing on Africa. She holds a master's in international economic development from the head of school at Brandy University in Massachusetts and a bachelor of arts from Davidson College, North Carolina, USA. Welcome, Amrote. Hi, good evening, ladies. Um, so I'm not going to talk at you. In fact, this is going to be a dialogue. Um, how many of you have been completely inspired and in awe of some of the ladies who've come forward? Don't be shy. They were pretty amazing. <laughs> Truly, I think in our next lifetime, I think I want to be an Angela, a Lynette, a Wamboi, and then eventually a Sean as well as, uh, as we go through. <laughs> yeah. But it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to admit that I am an imposter. Uh, there are people who create technology and there are people who consume technology. I am more of the latter. I consume technology, I can't code a line to save my life, uh, but thank God for engineers who do. Um, but, but I will tell you a little bit about my story. I think this is a, a bit of a free flow, so we'll go back and forth. Um, I joined Microsoft in 2013 uh, really because of the potential for Africa. Uh, I was abroad for a number of years. I'm originally from East Africa, from Ethiopia. Uh, but really, joining Microsoft, for me, was an important point of view in thinking of where is Africa today and what can technology do? I think Sean mentioned a few of the statistics around startups. What are happening? Where, where are you know, women doing? And how are we supporting entrepreneurship and, and SMEs? So there's a whole slew of discussions that are happening, but I never really understood what technology could really do until 2008, I was in Ghana working in microfinance, uh, part of my work around access to finance. And how many of you are familiar with the concept of microfinance? Right, a large number of you. And uh, the, the microfinance industry I was working with was actually focused on group lending. So in a group lending, if you're familiar with it, it's actually a group of women, five of them on average, who come together to take out a loan. And each woman signs off and is responsible to make sure that the loan is repaid on behalf of the group. So that means that if four of them default, that one unfortunate lady will have to pay the loan on time to make sure that they're able to cover the loans and get the second renewal. So, so that's the, the basic concept of microfinance. Particularly for this one group in uh, northern Ghana, um, out of the five women, um, they were all entrepreneurial, very well respected, they came together, they knew each other, etc. Um, they paid their loans twice, and on the third time, they actually came a bit early for the group meeting. They came a bit early and asked, you know, what is the process for actually eliminating members if they wanted to? And it was a bit puzzling because we didn't understand. The group was performing well, they were paying their loans, their businesses were thriving, and just we didn't understand what was happening. Until one of them said, actually, we are in a bit of a trouble because one of the ladies is not paying her loans and we've actually been covering for her for a long time. And we said, well, that's the, that takes quite a bit of courage. You know, why haven't you kicked her out? And they said, well, actually, it's a bit of a problem because she's the wife of the chief. So for all intended purposes, we'll have to keep paying on her behalf just to maintain her status, but for us to also maintain the cordiality in the group. So here's the solution that they came up with. The next day, the day of the repayment and the, lady, the day of the disbursement for the next round, the lady showed up. And when she showed up, they all stood in line. They said, well, actually, they said, they've made changes. The project has made changes. And she said, what changes have they made? Have we not paid? She said, no, no, we've paid. But this time, they're actually submitting names into a computer, and the computer proves whether or not people are able to get loans. And she said, they have. She said, yeah, yeah, they've installed a computer. She said, so what did the computer do? She said, well, it approved all four of us except for you. <laughs> so that lady, believe it or not, accepted that excuse, walked away, and they were able to bring in a fifth person. So I'm giving you that story because it really shows sort of the ingenuity at a very small level. These are women farmers that we're talking about in, in the northern rural area of Ghana, really able that allows them to continue developing their, their solutions, but also really understanding that you know there is a concept of technology. Their kids, fortunately, are able to use it sometimes and then able to, to interact with it. But for them at that very basic level, to be able to integrate it was very critical. So I'm very passionate about Africa. I love Africa. I believe in our potential. I believe in what we are doing, and I believe in sort of the generation of what we have. But technology in that aspect is super critical. Not because it allows us to come up with answers 
for loan repayments with microfinance, but really because the creation of content, the innovation story that we can tell from Africa can really catapult where Africa is today as we think of our competitiveness. You know, where do we stand today? You know, some people have known and hear about Kenya, mainly because of Ushahidi, of IHAP. How can we create more of those? You know, how do we create more of the success stories of women entrepreneurs who are coming up through the ranks? So we think of, of Juliana, we think of Veronica from Safarika. There's some phenomenal women in Africa who are doing great things. And how do we sort of give these women a platform so that they're able to inspire the next generation? We at Microsoft have had a number of programs and partnerships. Uh, one of the latest ones is with, with the USD department. Uh, driving a STEM camp in Kigali, uh, slightly outside of Kigali at the Koshura schools, where 120 girls came together for three weeks to learn, to develop, to code, to interact, to exchange uh, with girls who were selected from, our, from our different African countries, but also girls who came from the US to really give that blended approach to really say there is an opportunity to one, learn, share, build, test uh, some of the things that you've said, but really also encourage them so that they're not gun shy from science, from technology, from engineering, from math, so that they're able to really understand the potential, their own potential at executing, at delivering, at growing, at testing, uh, and really being able to showcase and to really say, you know, as we now go into 10th, 11th, 12th grade, as they're now thinking of making some critical decisions around their education, they're able to, to have the comfort of knowing that there is a possibility for them outside of some of the humanities backgrounds that are currently and mostly available to women. That's one. The second piece is around DigiGirls. So I think DigiGirls is one other initiative that we have proudly been sponsoring and supporting. And that's really thinking of providing mentorship, coaching, technical support, uh, virtual academy to girls across uh, Africa. And that's an initiative that has been adopted across Africa and we're looking at scaling that. But I think for me, you know, as, as we're thinking of this audience of, you know, women technology, there's, there's a coding piece of it and, and that's the sitting behind your terminal and, and the challenges that you face. Uh, but then there's also another piece around leadership, which is, you know, how do you have some phenomenal women like Sandberg, you know, to be at the top level of the likes of Facebook? How do you create more of those to come from Africa? How do we create more Africans to actually create the Facebooks and have the women to be the Sandbergs in those institutions? So I think it's the concept of how do we enable, how do we empower, how do we, you know, unleash the power and the support so that, you know, we can confidently walk around and, and share our stories. Um, I love Lynette's story around, you know, humility is for the weak. Fantastic. Embrace that. I think I want to put that on a t-shirt and walk around with it. But, you know, like how do we make and then bring those together so that, you know, as you're walking into the IHUB, you will find many women who are developing that. That you are able to start entrepreneur, like start businesses, become successful entrepreneurs, and then hire men to be behind you, right? So I think it's that concept of enablement, but also creating that cohesion whereby, you know, we're creating the sustainability, but also creating the path for the next generation to come as well. So I'm briefly going to stop at that um, and let the next speaker to come on. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Amanda Isharu Kimoli. Um, Amanda is co-founder and program director of Tech Republic Africa. Tech Republic is a technology education firm dedicated to increasing engagement in technology and computer science by making it more access, accessible to upper primary and high school students. Tech Republic has also partnered with Google and Intel, who are about to help Tech Republic develop a web-based curriculum for the students during the boot camp. Amanda is a marketer turned chef and nutritionist with no formal culinary training she is the reigning champion of the national Royco Fata Flavor cooking contest. And Amanda gives the traditional recipes she grew up with a completely modern and healthy twist while infusing them with global flavors. So maybe you're going to be serving us some of those recipes after this. So welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. So as you've heard, uh, like Amrota, I am not a techie, not a traditional techie. I am, I'd say many things, as you call a chef, uh, I'm a communicator, a marketer, and now I'm a, a techie in training, I'd say. Um, but a little bit about what I'm doing within the tech space and how 
I'm trying to contribute to Tech Republic towards building the ecosystem through education, particularly. So we are a STEM technology, um, STEM education provider. Can actually go to the next slide. Sorry. And how we're trying to do this is to demystify STEM. A lot of children, both boys and girls, are intimidated by science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They might have interests in, you know, typically what a teenager might be into sports or music or, you know, gaming, but they might not necessarily think that they could be the ones in control and behind that computer creating and using whatever talents and creativity and innovation that they do have to create the next big thing, the next Facebook, as I'm not just saying, you can go to the next. So what we're trying to do is give high potential youth in Africa the opportunity to get into STEM and shape their life outcomes, whether it means them getting into university or career paths that are relevant to STEM and ensuring that they can compete at a global level. Next slide. So currently what we have is a situation where Africa is generally behind the rest of the world as far as innovation is concerned. And a lot of people don't know that we actually originated some of the algorithms that are the foundation of computer science today, like the algorithm that runs many computers, actually the basic computers that became the you know, supercomputers that led to what we do have today originated in Ethiopia. So I think that we do have in some ways an inferiority complex that we are getting over with time, but we have to recognize that it's not an issue of intelligence, it's a more an issue of access to platforms that we can be able to leverage to create the next big thing. Next slide. So for us, the market opportunity here is that Africa is a young continent. We have 200 million people who are under the ages 15 to 24. And we have a situation where when it comes to women, with engineering students across the continent, only 7 to 12 percent are actually female. And we have to remember that where the world is going today, STEM and computer science particularly has to be incorporated within basic education. Practically 70% of all jobs within the next five to 10 years will require at least a basic understanding of STEM and will be to the advantage of children within this particular age group to understand how to code, even if it's at a basic programming level, so that they can leverage, again, the knowledge and the innovation, the creativity that they do have, being young and being thinking outside of the box to be able to find a place within this new global economy. Next slide. Okay, so what we do is, like I said, try and understand how we can be able to engage with children in a way that will be fun and interesting for them. So what we did at our innovation camp that was mentioned briefly is we partnered with Google to present computer science principles in a more fun and exciting way. So instead of having the traditional, sometimes to some, dry or academic way of presenting computer science principles, we did more from a perspective of your hobbies or your interests. So we had seven different tracks across music, sports, art, uh, animation, very unconventional, maybe in some ways, ways of looking at STEM. And we had the kids come up with projects using computer science principles within those particular interests. Actually, I actually have a video I want to play for you because it will illustrate it more and you'll be able to see it. But just to understand how we're trying to engage with children to get into coding as early as possible, and particularly with girls, helping them understand how they can get into tech and it's not something that's just for boys and it's not something that's just for someone who's traditionally within that particular mold of a scientist so you can play the video just jump through this and play It looks like quick times. Yeah. Can you play the actual video file? Yeah. Yeah, it's on the flash. Sorry, technical difficulties. We'll actually just play the file directly, the video file. Put the file to it. Yeah, it's just there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the sound is completely gone. 
you have a sound. You have a sound. You don't. You don't have an audio jack. It's there. That's the problem with the file itself. Um, the file was played. Mm, yeah. Okay, looks like we don't have sound, so maybe I'll just give you a very quick brief. So we had this camp from the 24th to the 20th of August in partnership with USIU, Google, and Intel. And over the five-day program, we had four days of coding where these kids chose two of the tracks that I had mentioned, music and sound, art, sports, all seven of these. And what we had was a situation where 75% of those 75 participants actually had never engaged with programming or computer science previously. And they were a bit intimidated during orientation, but they found because they engaged it in a way that was, you know, through their passions, they were able to understand the same computer science principles after those four days. And then again, when we're thinking about how we can be able to create leaders and entrepreneurs within the tech space, something that we have experienced is that a lot of techies do understand how to create you know, a great product, it works efficiently, it works very well, but they don't necessarily understand how to leverage it or to ensure that product they do create has market viability. So on the fifth day, we talked to them about careers, we talked to them about business, and how even as young as they are, because these kids are between 12 to 18 years of age, they can start thinking about creating the next big thing. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was a teenager when he created Facebook. Um, so the impact that we did have is 40% of the participants were girls, and the programs that we've run previously up until this point, again, have been very much focused on girls and women, and empowering them from a young, as young as possible, and showing them that despite um, not being able to necessarily access computer science through the traditional uh, A44 system that most students go to in Kenya, that they can be able to leverage online platforms that do exist. There's a lot of free information that's out there and get into tech. And then through our network of computer science clubs within selected schools across the country, after they finish the holiday camp, they get back into school. And once a week through the computer science club, they continue to engage with this content until the next holiday camp does roll around. So basically what I'm trying to emphasize is for us, it's about ensuring that as early as possible, we inculcate the culture of STEM, computer science, and tech, and just ensure that these kids are not intimidated. And we believe that in Africa, definitely, we shall create the next big thing that will have an impact not only on this continent, but across the world. So thank you for your time. Um, now I'd like to invite our speaker from I have. Uh, as you all know, um, if it wasn't for them, um, I think people mentioned this at the beginning of her uh, speech in the tip, we wouldn't be here. And I have generous, generous, generously provided this space to us so that we could hold this event. So I'm going to invite Nikesta Ware to give a speech uh, on behalf of her. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, well, first of all, I just would like to say thank you to the speakers that came before me and get, I have a shout out. Much appreciated. We didn't pay them. <laughs> um, so the IHAB is about five years old now, uh, began in about 2010. We actually celebrated our birthday in March of this year at the Arboretum. I'm not sure if there's anyone here that joined us. It was a pretty big, awesome party. Um, so the IHAP's primary role um, catalyzes in the tech community. We do this in three main ways. We do it by surfacing information. Um, that's primarily through our IHAP research arm, and they do a lot of um, tech-based research coming out of Africa. A lot of the resources are available on our website, ihabitsio.ke. Um, we also do this through um, supporting startups. We have a lot of startups in the space. Uh, we help them find funding, we offer them office hours from the, um, the IHUB team, and also we offer trainings, uh, different kinds of trainings that an entrepreneur that are taking would need. And then the third way that we do this is through connecting people. And by connecting people, I mean breaking down the barriers that exist that may not allow you to meet the kind of people, connect the kind of people that you'd like to meet. And that's the reason we often have um, a lot of awesome people coming into the space, people like Ban Ki-moon Ban Ki coming to the space, uh, people like the president of Kenya coming to the space, um, Marisa Maya coming to the space, and so on. Um, just We like to break down the barriers and allow you to connect with these people and ask them the questions you would like. You wouldn't ordinarily be able to ask them. Um, another way that you